there. I'm Jana. Nice to meet you. I'm a researcher. To be more specific, I'm a PhD student in the Electrical Engineering Division at Cambridge. But I'm also a member of the Center for Doctoral Training in Connected Electronic and Photonic Systems. My research focuses on holographic head-up displays for cars. Today, I would like to show you a day in my life as a researcher. I would like you to answer some of the questions of how researchers stay motivated on a day-to-day -day basis and where we draw our inspirations from. Welcome to the Cambridge Festival. To introduce our technology by having a look at the Cambridge Festival Mixed Reality Holographic Video Projections website, we can project both 2D and 3D holographic projections. One application area is projecting into the driver's eyes hazards on the road as 3D objects. These can be also inclusive by varying the color and the layout. Where do most scientists draw their inspirations from? I would argue most scientists draw their inspirations from nature. By having a walk in the park, most motivation, most ideas come to mind. This is also where Newton's famous idea and famous observation originated when he actually saw the phenomenon of gravity when an apple fell from the tree. This is also still holds true by walking in a park and being one with nature. This is where we draw our inspirations from. And this is part of our daily life as being a scientist. I, for example, have also ideas regarding um, when I walk through a park. I use modern technology, such as the new phones with LiDAR apps. What is LiDAR? This is a light detection and ranging. So this sensor allows me to scan objects and store them as point cloud data, which is three-dimensional. Well, we can imagine many applications from point cloud data storage and LiDAR scans. For example, when we think of automotive holographic head-up displays and when I want to project something as augmented reality, it needs to have depth, it needs to be in 3D. So the original object needs to be captured as 3D data. When I walk through the park, I always think about what are possible obstacles which we face as drivers on the road or simply pedestrians being uh, exposed to hazards on a daily basis. So, for example, a grown tree like this. I would go ahead and use my app. I would just simply open the phone on my, during my walk, called every point. I start scanning and this is how I do it. I start scanning the entire object. 360 degrees. Then it creates a point cloud visualization of all the points, which I later process in MATLAB and project within the, the optical system I developed to project later on in automotive holographic head-up displays. This is part of our everyday life as being scientists. Please present our optical system for head-up displays. We used a helium-neon laser, focusing lenses, a beam splitter, polarizers, and a spatial light modulator. We focused on enlarging the driver's eye box, obtaining accurate replay field results, and include 
people with various conditions in the transportation sector. Hello, Tim. Hello, Jana. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here today. So please, um, hello everyone. I would like to have the pleasure today to discuss science and research with Professor Tim Wilkinson, who is a professor of photonic engineering. He's my supervisor and the group leader of the Center for Molecular Materials, Photonics and Electronics. Tim, <laughs> it's a pleasure to have you here today. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Tim, I really wanted to start uh, by saying that um, carrying out research is, I think, very exciting. But I wanted also um, to ask your opinion. Could it be maybe challenging? Or um, what are actually, where do we get our inspirations and motivation to pursue different kinds of research on a daily basis? Well, I, um, I I chose engineering as a discipline many, 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 many years ago um, because I always wanted to take science. I loved science. I love maths, but I always wanted to do something practical with it. I always wanted to see it go somewhere. I wasn't so interested in just the theory or the equations. I wanted to see it do some practical thing, and it doesn't have to be anything significant. It could be a, a standard you know, piece of engineering that changes an infrastructure, that changes technology. But it was just knowing that I had somehow contributed a small piece to the jigsaw puzzle that became a product or a, or a concept or anything that actually created some kind of change. And I, I it's always what's driven me in this field was the, the, the ability to contribute, but in a very practical way. Um, so my inspiration always comes from the way in which the world um, essentially dictates to us uh, how things change. So uh, if it's if I'm working in displays, it's how we perceive the information, it's the applications that we use the information and the display technology in, and all those things then lead to a, a new type of technology which will hopefully have some element of my research, hopefully your research, um, yeah. will contribute, and uh, it becomes this kind of uh, uh, practical thing that we've developed together and, uh, and uh, a good example was a few years ago my students started the company and they made a little holographic projector and it was just so pleasing seeing it on the desk it was actually a thing that research from my group and other groups combined together had made this little object which uh, became a commercial product it, it had its ups and downs but fundamentally it existed it wasn't just a concept it wasn't just a, a, a paper it was actually a real physical object and I've always been so proud of that particular structure because all those ideas came together and there was quite a lot of work to develop this little box which projected images. That was kind of one of the highlights of my career so far. That's what really inspires me seeing that kind of development in the real world. Thank you so much. I think I fully agree with you that this seeing how, for example, our research could potentially impact people's lives for the good is, is so rewarding. That, that's so exciting. I think as well, um, for me, my, my aim also to go into research was to, to learn something new, build up a network and, and a group of researchers with the same goal. And I think that that's actually what motivates me as well. Uh, thank you so much. Um, can I please also ask you, for example, how is research nowadays carried out? Is it, um, for example, interdisciplinary? Can we reach out? I know in our group we have a lot of opportunities, which you already mentioned, and, and we have the basis for it to reach out to companies, to other researchers. And what do you think? How it will look like um, carrying out research in future years? Well, I think your first point, interdisciplinarity is, is really important because it brings in new ideas, it brings in new approaches, and it freshens everything up. In, in academia, particularly, it's very easy to get stuck in a rut, to get stuck in what you know, what you do, and just keep on doing it. And I can make a whole career of that, just churning out papers on things I know and do. But actually, it's when something new comes in, it's when something different comes in. A few years ago, it was um, it was endoscopic imaging for cancer research. That suddenly opened up a whole new avenue of things that we could do with optics and holography, which hadn't really occurred before. And before that, we were doing relatively simple things like displays and telecoms. But then all of a sudden, we were doing cancer detection. And that was a really big um, change of direction. 
I learned a whole bunch of new ideas, a whole load of new theories, and I met some really interesting people, collaborated with them, discovered how really hard and difficult cancer is, and how frustrating a research error it is, and how any small step forward is a game changer for you know people surviving, people people getting through these traumas. So um, it, that was a really good example of how interdisciplinarity really impacted on my uh, research at the time. In terms of the future of research, I think the big thing that's happened recently is, of course, the pandemic. And uh, that's really changed my understanding of how, for instance, my research group functions as, a, as an entirety. For me, I'd come in every day, I'd talk to people, but actually there are other ways of communicating which have come out of this whole um, pandemic process, which means that through things like, you know, video conferencing, etc., I can actually communicate better with my students than I could if I was running around Cambridge teaching in the labs and very difficult to find. So actually, I've found that I've been more available and more communicative since uh, we had went through the various lockdowns. So I think the, the way we're going to come out of this process is a combination of the two. I think personal contact is very important as well. Meeting people in the lab, seeing what they're doing, um, breaking their experiments, <laughs> that kind of thing is a very important part of the process. So uh, um, the two together combine and make what I think is going to be the, the future direction of research. It's going to be a combination of of those two uh, areas. Um, <clears throat> it's, yeah, research is a very difficult thing to predict because you never quite know where it's going to go or how it's going to pan out. So um, what always happens is that something comes up the next day or the next week, which completely changes the way in which you do things, completely changes the way in which you think about things. And that's what's important about being an academic. It's about being flexible. It's about not letting any change upset you and always look for the positive direction forward. And that's, you know, for me, the future of research is really whatever the future brings to me in terms of applications, collaborations. There's some interesting things happening in my future shortly, which will probably change my direction of research again. And so who knows? Um, it's a very difficult thing to predict exactly, but it, it, it's that's what I love about research is the unpredictability of it. Thank you so much for elaborating on this, and I could not agree more. I think you have been available to all of us a lot, and you guide us all, always, and you really encourage us to um, establish collaborations with other researchers. And this is one big part which inspires me a lot as well, to, to get new views on something, and uh, yeah, completely, which can change the direction of, uh, of any research. Thank you, big fan of that. And uh, maybe um, just a last question, because you mentioned uh, optics and holography. You are doing research about light. And I think that's extremely exciting and so in a manifold of ways, and it can have so many different application examples. Um, can you please discuss how you think can holography actually benefit um, us for social good? Well, we're surrounded by light. Light is our <laughs> environmental you know, visual property of choice. Yeah. So therefore, um, be able to control and understand that light is really fundamental to how we interact with it in, in any way, whether it be for a medical application, a display application, telecommunications, whatever. Um, they all require an interaction with the light at the most fundamental photonic level. And we don't really understand that at the moment. We we kind of dip our toes in the water, playing around with different things. However, there's a couple of very fundamental things about light. One is that it's a wave. And so therefore, if we use those wave-like properties of light, then the control mechanism should harness those properties. And holography is, as far as I know, the best way to do that. It uses the wave-like properties as effectively as you can. It doesn't block the light. It doesn't um, uh, in any way um, <clears throat> reduce the light. It just essentially steers it using interference to create whatever you want the light to do, whether it be optical fibers, endoscopes, the eye, whatever you want to control the light in, the actual diffraction process is what you know, the holograms use to control it. So holography is really kind of a very fundamental issue. What we The problem is, we have limitations in how we control it. The control mechanisms we have only have certain properties that we can use. So therefore we have to take the ideal theory of light and convert it into this restricted or somehow limited version that we use in our technologies. And that's kind of where the research lies at the moment is making that bridge as efficient as possible. Because I can make a display, but it doesn't look very good because of the limitations of my devices. I can make an endoscope, but it doesn't work very well because of the limitations of the optical fibers we use. So therefore, holograms have the ability to control the light in the way we want, 
but we don't understand how to harness it yet. So a lot of our research at the moment is trying to pull apart this control mechanism at the fundamental level and figure out exactly how what we want the light to do versus what it actually does are related to each other. And if we can close that loop, then it will be a serious um, breakthrough. One of the problems with all this is that, of course, because light's a wave, we can't see those wave-like properties easily. There isn't a wave detector um, or a phase camera, as we like to think of it in our lab, um, readily available. And that's one of the problems. We're kind of working blind to a certain extent because we can't actually see what the light can do. Um, but that's really kind of, for any particular impactful application, um, the control of the properties of light at the most fundamental level is really the heart of holography. And that's, if we can, if we can master that, then really there's a whole range of different applications which will, which will have huge impact on social life, on um, health, on uh, technology, on economics. All these things will come out of this. It's a really big breakthrough if we can if we can solve this problem and yeah it may not happen in my research career but I hope at least I will contribute you know elements of that process people will know me for what I've done and will then move on and hopefully make this problem a, a reality in the future so that's what holography is it's really just a way of controlling light thank you absolutely and um, I, I, I am sure that um, we already know you for contributing towards the research area of optics, holography, liquid crystals, and everything really to do with light and engineering. And uh, it's so exciting just to work with you on a daily basis and explore and talk to different people. And I think this is very inspiring. I think for anyone who is interested in why we have so many colors outside, like the rainbow and the, the butterflies having different colors. And not only that, this can all have a big impact also on how to facilitate our everyday life. And I think that's, that's a great um, advantage to pursue a career in a re as a researcher and, and as a scientist. Yep. Tim, and thank you. There should be no limitations as well. Don't ever yeah. think that there is a reason why these things can't be done. The, the, the best researchers are the ones that have the most open minds and the people that think the most um, kind of openly. And uh, as you get older, that gets harder and harder. So it's young people like yourself, Jana, that are really important in the creation of new ideas. I'm just the old guy in the background that kind of directs traffic. But if you got a few young people don't um, you know, work to your potential, then uh, the research will essentially um, will die. So it's, it's really important that there are new young students coming through the labs, coming through the universities, and uh, yeah, there should be no restrictions to that process whatsoever, because that's the key to research. It's, it's, it's not the ideas, it's the people involved. It's really important. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I, mean that I think it's so important to that the young generation and and uh, just the, that the people uh, find the ways into research and anything that they find on a daily life that could be improved. I think that's as well part of research and thank you for motivating us as well to pursue a career in research. I, I really hope that many more people will come and join us and uh, work together with us as well. Me too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time and um, yeah we are always open to questions and uh, we always welcome also working with anyone who is interested in working with us. So thank you so much for providing that opportunity and uh, that platform for future discoveries. A pleasure, Jana, as always. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I, I really um, enjoy having the discussion within the Cambridge Festival 2022. And um, yeah, thank you very much. I wish you a lovely day. And uh, yeah, I see you very soon. Yep, take care. Our future research will focus on mixed reality holographic video projections. I hope that you feel as enthusiastic as we do about this topic. If you have any questions, please do feel free to reach out to any of us. We wish you a wonderful experience at the Cambridge Festival. Thank you very much and bye.